So I'm Travis, for those of you that don't know me. I, I always feel a little awkward when I'm in the bookstore because as a doctor, I spend a lot of time in med school, and this is where I would study. I'd go up to the coffee shop at the bookstore, find a little corner, get my cup of coffee, and I was always like, all right, everyone be quiet. We're at the library. So I'll talk softly, but hopefully loud enough for the camera. Um, I'm just going to talk really briefly about the book, the motivation for the book, and then open it up for questions and answers, and I'll do my best to openly and honestly answer any questions that, that you may have. And then we'll get you outside and enjoy this nice warm weather. Um, has anyone had the chance to look at the book, glance through it? Well, first of all, let me start off by saying that the title is really meant to be taken with a, a grain of salt. Don't be that girl. And it's written with Leah Furman, who obviously is a female. And the point, or I should say the impetus for writing this book, is that over the years, my female friends are always asking, what is the male perspective? And what is going on in that male mind? And in particular relationship situations, why is he thinking the way he's thinking? Or what might I be doing to sabotage my relationship? And so the original intent with this book was to, to write a book that was completely non-judgmental in a way where if as a woman you're frustrated in your relationships, if you're constantly finding that they're not going past the first or second date, or if they are, you're constantly talking to your female friends about why do I always end up with the wrong guy? And so what I tried to do in this book together with Leah is outline specific behaviors that really all of us engage in sometimes that can prevent us from getting the what I call the happiness and fulfilling relationship that I think we all deserve. And so when I say don't be that girl, it essentially is talking about don't be that girl who settles for less than she deserves. Because if you go into your relationships with an open mind, a clear head, believing in who you are and what you have to offer, men will know and they'll stick around to find out why. And one of the things about this book is through all the experiences I've had, everyone thinks initially, well, this is a book about he was the bachelor and this is a book about all of his experiences, which it, it certainly is a part of, of who I am, so it does partly define myself. But as much as anything, one of the, the real uh, motivators for me to write this book is as an ER doctor over the years I've seen how extreme a relationship gone awry how extreme the result of that can be for both males and females so I wanted to write a book that basically said okay we've all struggled we've all felt terrible emotions in relationships and we sit around sometimes and beat ourselves up about it and that's okay, that's part of life, but if you're not getting what you want, you gotta figure out why. Take a look in the mirror. And this book is meant to be really fun, really lighthearted, but also it does give some tough love. And the reason it gives tough love is I've realized in life, if you don't challenge people, usually it's, it's a lot more difficult to take that look in the mirror and say, you know what, I really am struggling in my relationships. And one of the most important things when I was writing this book, I realized is I very easily could have written a book called Don't Be That Guy. I just didn't think that anyone who's a male would actually want to hear from me. But <laughs> um, that was really the, the major point for the book. And either we can do a quick Q&A or I can, uh, I can read a couple of paragraphs from the book to try to give you all an idea of what it, what it really um, embodies. I'll tell you what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a couple paragraphs because sometimes I think that's the best way to, to indicate kind of what is contained within the book. So what I do in the book is I outline specific behaviors, what I like to say are behaviors that can potentially get in your way in your relationships. And again, each and every one of these behaviors, at some point, I myself have engaged in, so I speak from experience. But uh, there's a chapter entitled, entitled Bitter Girl, so I'm, I'm just going to read a little bit about this. It starts off, each chapter I start off with what I call a little bit of tough love. And that is asking yourself, okay, could I be a little bit bitter in my relationships? So we've all been hurt at some point in our lives. We've all been through bad relationships, awful breakups, and the inevitable lonely nights that follow. 
We've all spent at least a few hours trying to curse the entire opposite sex into oblivion. And some have even resorted to writing poems about loss, heartbreak, and the cruel nature of love. Now those of you who have gotten over your frustration and moved on to forge satisfying relationships can relax. I can pretty much guarantee that this chapter is not going to hold a lot of relevance for you. The rest of you keep reading because you may very well have something in common with Bitter Girl. I have to admit, sometimes you can't exactly blame people for feeling bitter. I feel bitter just watching some of my friends' relationships unfold. But while anger and bitterness are a normal part of post-traumatic relationship stress, most people strive to move past these negative and counterproductive emotions. Like I said, we've all been there. The hatred and hostility may last a month, a year, or even longer, but eventually they are replaced by kinder, gentler attitudes. Then there's Bitter Girl. Bitter girls are easy to spot. If you can't identify one by the ticked off look on her face, her defensive stance, or the frequent comparison she draws between men and farm animals, <laughs> You'll certainly figure it out when you ask her for phone number and she responds with something to the effect of, right, like you're actually going to call. And heaven help you if she starts in on her ex-boyfriend or ex-husband. To hear her talk about that, we'll say bleep bleep, and that's really kind of what's in here. As she still so lovingly calls him, you'd think he got her pregnant, left her at the altar, and ran off with her TV set and her sister. But who knows, maybe he has. And that's the sad truth behind the bitter girl's tough, take no prisoners facade. She is traumatized by her past relationships and she's hung on to that anger and resentment for so long that they have come to, def come to define her entire personality. Any guy who tries to date her will have his work cut out for him, believe me. Deep down, the only thing this woman really wants is revenge and she will make every man pay for the mistakes of the man who has hurt her. And so each chapter starts off with sort of this honest analysis, what I call the tough love. Try to make it not threatening when you're reading it, but there's always a quiz, and the quiz is, could you be bitter when you're in your relationships? And I talk about dead giveaways to, to how guys can tell if they're on a date with someone, and they sense that the woman they're, they're with has a very negative attitude towards dating or is resentful. And then I try to go through also experiences that I've had in my own personal life or in the ER or things that can really affect your health if you are bitter in your relationship. So what I like to call the bitter pills. I don't want to start wagging my finger at you and telling you about the actual health risks of going through life constantly feeling bitter, bitter and miserable. I think by now we all know that stress leads to unhealthy habit, habits and high blood pressure, which leads to heart disease and so forth. And this is the ER doctor and me talking. I could go on, but I'll stop because the truth is that these physical consequences are nothing compared to the emotional and psychological pain that bitter people put themselves through on a daily basis. The saddest thing of all about being bitter is that if you spend enough time assuming the worst, eventually you buy into all your own hype and start believing that the world has nothing good in store for you. You stop taking risks, you don't pursue your dreams, be they personal or professional, and good things actually stop happening to you. Hope is replaced by bitterness, and that's what I call tragic. And then last but not least, every chapter I go through, and after I've been kind of that, that tough love doctor, I say, all right, if something's broken, then we've got to fix it. And I try to go through and say, okay, if you, if you are feeling bitter in your relationships, whatever you do, don't date that guy. And I list particular guys that you don't want to date because there are plenty of guys out there who will do nothing but, but continue to try to take your self-esteem away from you and make you even more and more bitter about the, uh, the male population. <laughs> and then I try to end every chapter with a very optimistic tone and your personal prescription and then what I call the, the fake it till you make it um, advice. And I'll just read one more paragraph, and it's called The Bitter and the Sweet. More than anything else, bitter girls deserve compassion. So if after reading this chapter you're starting to realize that maybe you are a bitter girl, don't take it too hard. Nobody enters the world feeling bitter. It's a quality that we acquire with age, and usually for legitimate reasons. The tragic thing about this type of personality is that it conceals your true nature, which is idealistic. Sadly, bitterness is often the result of disappointed expectations. At one point, you probably thought quite highly of people. It was only when you got hurt that you realized that people, men in particular, 
are not necessarily looking out for your best interest and that you can't trust everyone. Naturally, you reacted by swinging to the other extreme, to the other extreme. But now is the time to return to the center and rediscover the person that you really are. And that's a person who is kind. The reason you once had such high hopes for the world is because at heart, you yourself are a very kind person. Certainly, it only seemed natural to believe that everyone thought and felt the same way you did. When you realized that this wasn't the case, you decided, no more Miss Nice Girl. And now you're paying the karmic price. And I, I finish it off with saying, the sweetest and most idealistic people are the ones who often wind up the most embittered. And as a basically decent and righteous person, a little effort is all that stands between you and the light, happy, and warm personality that is your birthright. All right, I'm done reading. Any questions? Linda? <laughs> We've been hanging out all day. I know I've already answered all your questions. Any comments? Anyone want to just talk about love and relationships and that? Well, I have to ask, are you glad you went on The Bachelor? Absolutely. And I, I was very hesitant to do so. I, I didn't apply to do it. I was at dinner one night in Nashville, Tennessee, and, and uh, I was approached. And a month later, I was in Paris. So, you know, at heart, I'm a doctor. That's who I am. And I have a chapter in here called Working Girl. And in that, I talk about my own personal experience of being the working guy. And, and when The Bachelor came calling, I had really been um, ignoring my personal life a little bit. And it forced me to open my mind to the importance in my life of romance and relationships and how important it is to me to find the right person. And I sit before you at the age of 35. I'm still single, and I'm still I'm not the, the expert on relationships. All that I know, and I can't tell you where do you go to meet that person, all that I know is that you have to take chances in life. And whether it be, heck, you can be the bachelor and go to Paris. Well, you know, you have to. You have to take that chance, whether it works out or not. And one of the ironies is I actually just found out that um, during my season in Paris, one of the producers for the show and one of the women who was on the show, when they went back to, to L.A. after it was all filmed, they ran into each other at a coffee shop and now they're engaged. So it worked out for someone. And I think that's the, the wonderful thing about relationships is you never can predict when you're going to meet that person. All that you can do, and this is what I've learned in my life, is be prepared so that when you do meet them, you're putting your best foot forward. And it's not one of those situations where you meet someone and they're the perfect match for you and you go into that relationship. And I'm not going to use words like bring your A game, but you go into that relationship really not knowing what, who you are and what you offer. And so instead of being excited about it, you enter the relationship with fear. And, um, and that's one, certainly one of the lessons that I, that I learned as The Bachelor is that um, when you're meeting a number of, of different members of the opposite sex all at once, you can very quickly tell who's sincere and who's not, and who's very comfortable with who they are, and who's what I like to describe as putting on a show and not really comfortable um, with who they are. And, and the ultimate message, the, the epilogue is called, if you believe in yourself, he'll know. And, and if there's one message that I've learned in my life, watching all of my friends' relationships, um, the wonderful relationships that I've had, it's, it's always when the two people entering the relationship are honest with each other and with themselves. And, um, and when I say don't be that girl, I'm essentially saying just be yourself. Don't be that girl who's trying so hard to impress everyone else. Don't always be looking externally for reinforcement. All you got to do is look inside, internally, and if you become comfortable with who you are internally, then you're going to end up fine. And, um, and certainly, you know, to, to again compare, The Bachelor was six weeks of my life. So I've, I, you know, I, I based most of my experiences on, on a lot of other things, including being an ER doctor, a brother, a friend, um, a bachelor, not just the bachelor. And... Um, but yeah, I, I bring up a quote quite often, which is, um, I think I was maybe 23 or four years of age, and it was when I decided to become a doctor, and I was really hesitant to do it because I had never studied science in college, and I was working at a free clinic, and I, I really 
saw something in the doctors working there that I admired, and I quit my job and went back and did all my post-baccalaureate undergrad classes. And the quote that I read before I did that was, life is either a daring adventure or nothing from Helen Keller. And I've tried to have that guide me in everything I do. And it's amazing how if, you, if you're willing to take some chances in life, at the end of it all, it's going to pay off. And when I, when, it's an interesting story. When I went to go be the bachelor, I came back, and I'll be the first to admit there was a part of me that, well, I'm a physician. What are all my peers going to think of me? But my physician friends were the ones who really encouraged me to do it the most. And so when I came back, one of, uh, one of my female friends, one of my f female friends who's a surgeon, we spend about 120 hours a week in the hospital. We don't really... We're socially dysfunctional. That's probably a good way to put it. And uh, she came up to me and said, Travis, you, you, you motivated me to sign up on Match.com. And she started dating a guy, and, and six months later, they were engaged and getting married. And, and again, part of don't be that girl is don't, don't limit your options in life. You know, be willing to, who knows when you're going to meet the person even if it's in Paris as The Bachelor. <laughs> Are you still in I moved to Colorado a year and a half. Can you repeat the question? Oh, absolutely. So the question is, am I still living in Nashville? And the answer is no. I moved to Colorado a year and a half ago. And I split my time in Colorado between uh, a wonderful hamlet in the mountains at 9,300 feet and then Denver. So about half the time I'm working at an ER in Denver and half the time in the mountains which is why it's nice to be here right now because I think they got 30 inches of snow a couple days ago and it's I'm wearing a t-shirt outside today I, I wore shorts and went for a run so thank you Atlanta <laughs> for warm weather sometimes I, one of the reasons that I I moved to the mountains of Colorado after this entire experience is I just needed some time to myself to get away from all the what, what I like to call instant um, celebrity is not the word because I'm not a celebrity, but instant recognition. In Nashville in particular, I, I was very noticeable and a lot of people would actually come to the ER trying to have me provide care for them, which is very awkward. <laughs> And there were some very strange chief complaints that, uh, <laughs> but I was well guarded. We have a very big ER at Vanderbilt. So if someone would come in and say, um, I'm, I'm having a very strange complaint today. I was hoping Dr. Stork could check it out for me. They went to the opposite side of the ER that I was on. So it actually ended up working well. But ironically, I work in one of the ERs I work in now is a, um, it's what we call a level three trauma center up in the mountains. And it's a big referral center. And sometimes if people are out there visiting the mountains, whether they're hiking or they've come out to go ski, you know, they'll show up to the ER. I heard that Dr. Stork had moved out here. Um, could he provide my care? <laughs> and it's, you know, it's flattering for sure. And it actually, it, it actually is a nice thing because as anyone knows who's ever been to the doctor, particularly the ER, it's a very stressful situation. And I like to think that most of the people who recognize me or, or know me from, um, I've been doing a, a fair amount of work on Dr. Phil as a physician, and if they recognize me, that, that patient-physician interaction is more comfortable. Of course, of course, if they come in and they say, I can't believe you did that, I can't believe you were the bachelor, <laughs> then it's a little uncomfortable. No, it, it, it really is, it really is, um, nice when a patient comes in and they say, oh, it's so nice to meet you in person. Um, it's awkward, though, when, if someone comes in with the sole purpose of meeting me. <laughs> Any other questions? Life, about the weather, about what snow looks like? Well, thank you all for coming, and I'd be happy to, to talk more individually, certainly to, to sign a copy. And this is a book, I'll, I'll finish with this. 
this is the first time I've ever written a book, and, and I'm one of those guys who um, really feels like when I do something, I want to give it my best, and I want it to have meaning. And this is the one thing I'm the most proud about this book is I really think it's a, a really fun, lighthearted read. It, it's, it's, it's an easy read. And at the end of it, if nothing else, it just forces you to think about life, your relationships, and, and who you are. And if nothing else, I'm proud of that. So thanks for coming. And I'll just be sitting up here for the next hour or so, or as long as <laughs> not everyone at once. We don't want to be overwhelmed. Thank you. Thanks for coming.